I'm Jen Valenga, and this is the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, I'm so glad to have you back. You are here because you are multi-talented, fearless, and you're looking for inspiration to follow a fulfilling career path. There are roadblocks, or what I like to call falling wrenches, especially now. But heads up, fearless friends, you can ditch your backup plan. How you are as a human in this world really, really matters. And, and I think especially for female identifying folks, we get this message that that kindness and assertiveness are mutually exclusive. And I think to be successful, you can be a kind person and truly treat people the way you want to be treated and have good boundaries and say no to things or that's not okay with me. Today's episode features psychologist Dr. Elisa Hurwitz. You might know Dr. Hurwitz as Dr. Drama on Instagram. In this episode, we discuss self-care, identity, boundaries, and the impact of brain development on your ability to process the challenges of an industry shutdown. Since this episode is about self-care, why don't we start by taking a deep breath? We've all been holding our breath for many months, for many reasons. Just take a breath with me. (sighs) Did you do it? You didn't do it, did you? Let's do it again. (sighs) You know you're going to feel better. If you'd like inspiration to come straight to your inbox, send me an email at ditchyourbackupplan at gmail.com or log on to ditchyourbackupplan.com, and there's a pop-up to enter your email there. I promise I won't spam you. I'm just going to send you inspiration and a newsletter with show notes. Here's my interview with Dr. Elisa Hurwitz. Dr. Elisa Hurwitz, hello. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I should say that we are talking on... November 6th. So we are we are mired in the election news right now. So we've stepped away <laughs> to take a break. <laughs> yes. A, a, a welcome distraction. A welcome distraction. Where are you calling from today? Uh, so I'm calling from my home office <laughs> where I've been working for the past uh, eight months um, in uh, southern New Hampshire. We don't know each other personally, I should say, not before this moment, but I know you as Dr. Drama on the Mental Health Live series on Instagram. So yeah. I found you because some of the people I've interviewed, you've also interviewed, and I found you on Instagram. I was like, oh, we should talk because, you know, mental health and, yeah. and artists is a, is a big thing. So how did you get to become Dr. Drama? It's funny because people will sometimes, you know, kind of uh, young, young people in college will will contact me and ask, well, how do I get to do your job? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know because I made it up. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'd always been on track to become a psychologist, um, you know, since I was pretty young. That was my, that was, that was clear to me that that was my path, you know, I, but I've also always had a love and a passion for musical theater, not as a creator, as an audience member, that was always where my, I saw my role and I, it really suited me. Uh, you know, kind of fast forward to, you know, mid career, I'm settled in, you know, in my, in my work and, you know, I'm in a great group private practice and I'm just really comfortable and kind of all the learning curve that you're going through that all of the, you know, for the doctoral program and then the early career stuff has now, you know, kind of been met. Um, which is great, but it also it also takes some of that that challenge, the fulfillment of 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 new challenges. Uh, and I was really happy with my with my clinical work, and I didn't want to I didn't want that to be different, but I knew that there was something that I was seeking, and it just came to me like an epiphany does, I suppose, <laughs> um, to do something with um, with musical theater, but bringing in my professional knowledge. And I looked and there was nobody else out there doing this. So I said, okay, well, that's it. I'm going to talk about musical theater through the lens of, of, you know, mental health and psychology and kind of bring that expertise uh, to talk about those topics. And it's just, there's 
and it's endless what you, it is what, yeah. What there is to say about it. Yep. And so that's, that's how it happened. Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Um, hmm. Three years, two years. It's, I mean, gosh, this year is like 10,000 years. So it, it makes feels, it makes it feel hard to count, but yes. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe September was just three years. When you talk about getting settled into your career and and looking for a new challenge, that fits right into the theme of what I talk about on this show, which is, you know, there's no real making it. There's you, mm. you get you reach a milestone and then you build new milestones because yes. or else you become complacent. But you you got there and you went, OK, got here. Now what's next? And it sounds like that's the place from which you built this mental health live series. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, so the mental health live series specifically was a, a response to the pandemic. Ah, okay. Yeah. And th- th- so that's been happening since March of this year. Um, Dr. Drama itself, just the exploration of that, of that intersection of psychology and theater, which encompasses not just talking about, you know, people's, you know, personal experiences with mental health, but also examining shows um, from a psychologist perspective, you know, for example, like the, the uh, domestic violence and waitress or uh, the anxiety and Dear Evan Hansen or, you know, oh, even, next to normal. There's so many. Yeah. Or even a show that's not as obviously about mental health, like, um, uh, you know, like Showboat. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, well, that, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, issues of colorism and how that overlaps with uh, issues of generational trauma. So it's it's all there. There's so much rich to mine from. Um, so Dr. Drama first was that, was was writing pieces about shows from the perspective of a psychologist. From the storytelling perspective of mental health within musical theater. I see. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it, uh, I let it kind of lead me where, where, where it was going to, which, which quickly morphed into also talking to actors about the psych, you know, kind of the, both their, you know, their own experiences with mental health and self-care, self-care, and also, you know, talking about kind of the psychology of acting, uh, you know, and how they get into a role and just, you know, again, it's just endlessly, and endless, endless content there. Uh, and then it, then it morphed from there into uh, live talks and, and, and presentations for, you know, kind of the most obvious one being Broadway con and uh, had one particular talk where the room was, was jam full of people like overflow. They had to deny people coming in and it was a panel of actors from Broadway. Uh, uh, let's see. We had uh, uh, Patty Murin, um, Alexander Silber, Kyle uh, Scatliff, Nora Shell. I'm forgetting one person, but it, it, it to talk about their experience. These are all people who have, who have publicly talked about their experiences with mental, mental health problems. Uh-huh. And, and so this was a panel specifically about mental health problems and people wanted to be there and talk about it. Um, and it was just so thrilling. And then when the pandemic hit, this was just my, my, my offering. This is, you know, let me create a space where we can talk about this, you know, about mental health, which is, uh, you know, something so important to talk about and something that, that we don't talk about enough. But now that everybody is clearly, clearly, you know, affected by this crisis, Oh, for years to come, for yes. years to come, yeah. this is going to be affecting artists. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and just every, everybody. Right. And so uh, it was obvious to me, it was clear to me that there was, there was a need to a desire to be talking more about it, which of course thrilled me because that's, that's what I'm here for and uh, opened up the conversation. And, and, and so that's been kind of my, my, my offering um, since the pandemic started. Oh, and it's been so helpful to so many people, not just the person you interview, I'm sure, but because you can reach such a wide audience. Exactly. That has to feel very gratifying, I imagine. It does. Um, it, it, it really does. It really does feel gratifying. And, you know, to know that um, not only are we being part of dismantling the stigma um, by, you know, by having these conversations, um, but also just giving, also giving people a place to kind of land and, and, not feel so alone with it. You know, I think about the conversation recently with Jason Danieli, um, who, you know, famously lost his, his incredible wife, Maren Maisie, um, about two years ago to cancer. And, you know, he talks so publicly about his experience with grief, you know, just like how kind of profound the responses were to that, to that conversation in that conversation, um, you know, with 
him and with people who were there and, and participating, talking matters, <laughs> talking about this stuff matters. And, it, and it's, it is just, it's really, it is really powerful to be part of that and, and to, to have people uh, be there and, 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 you know, taking something um, meaningful away from those conversations. Yeah, I, I I see that. And I think we in the last I don't I won't even say the last decade, I'll say the last five years, it feels like the industry as a whole is becoming more. It's not like we weren't aware it's becoming more, um, let's say committed to bringing more resources into the space for actors to take care of themselves and their mental health. The routine, maybe it's not even a routine yet, of bringing in a um, intimacy director, mm-hmm. you know, which which is in the space of mental health. For sure, I'm a professor at Kansas State University, and we have the only drama therapy graduate program in the Midwest. Yeah. And I know for me, we did a we did the play Columbinus about five years ago mm. about the tragedy in Columbine. I, if I could go back in time, I would not have done it. Um, it was difficult for all of us but i will say the audiences it packed houses packed houses wow. of people who needed to hear that story but it took its toll on us but we brought in the drama therapist to do de-rolling with us to right. make sure that everybody could step away from the grief and everything we were carrying working on that show so i think it's becoming more of a resource that theater companies and certainly film as think film and television are thinking about more. I just wonder though, with the finances of live mm. theater, if that it will go away <laughs> or <laughs> right. I don't know. What, what are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, it did, it did certainly seem like uh, in the theater world um, that there was, that there's been a pattern now of, of incorporating um, intimacy directors much more so into, into their creative process rehearsal process um you know i think about a show like the musical jagged little pill uh, you know there's content about um sexual assault uh, and a song specifically about that where some of the movement is uh representing uh different characters and their own experiences with um being a survivor and and you know and having gone gone through their own experiences with sexual assault and um and they they used an intimacy director uh, you know and and certainly for that scene include, but all of the scenes, um, you know, not so much the men, not so much directly like the mental health. I mean, that's a theme that I've, at least in, you know, with the Broadway folks I've, I've interviewed that they point out that, um, you know, uh, producers or, you know, the shows will be very, they're very quick. Of course, it's just the rigor to have, um, you know, to have a, a PT offered, physical therapy and even at that you know you have to like get on top of signing up for one of the two slots of the day or the week or whatever right. <laughs> <laughs> um but that you know but that the same is not offered for mental health um which is funny that we take such good care of their physical bodies but not their minds you know not their souls and it's so much of what it's equally part of i mean so much a part of the industry is you know taking on and the psychology of character and all of that and relationship right right and you know uh you know think about a show again like jagged little pill where there there is content of, of sexual assault and you know if we just look at statistics you know there's a large percentage of female identifying folks who are, are have been victims are survivors and so the chances of you know a, a bunch of that cast being survivors themselves is is you know pretty much guaranteed and and so you know are they being triggered now by the choreography by the touch by the content you know even kind of uh you know going through those motions Absolutely. And even if you would love to say, I don't think I can do that show because it's triggering for me, the reality of the business Mm. and the job is that you probably have to take it. And then how do you manage your own psyche when you've said yes to something that Mm. maybe you might not have if you didn't need it? There's a financial reality to it, um, you know, for sure. Uh, Yeah. And and also, also the narrative that is uh, around especially broadway is the show must go on and that it's a it's such a it's such a high uh, value behavior to go on no matter what <laughs> mm-hmm. you know which is not really healthy uh 
yes, the show must go on. And there, there, are, there are ways to, to set that up uh, so to ensure that. But, um, but that doesn't have to include g- going on at such a high personal cost. You, you know, if you're really sick or, you know, whatever's going on. Yeah. You have to remember that this is a profession where one day a week for a day off is acceptable. Eight right. shows a week is appropriate. Right. One day off a week as your break is a, is an acceptable uh, lifestyle. Right. So it's a, it's a profession of obsessives. Mm-hmm. And then how do you take care of yourself during that? I mean, do you see? Do you? I would. Do you agree with that notion that it's a profession of obsessives? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think for some people it's it's obsessive. I think for some people it's it can be almost manic. Um, just go, go, go. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, so I think there's kind of a variety of places. Um, I think for some people, they're just really high energy and they kind of, they thrive um, and it's not necessarily symptomatic, you know? And yeah. And so, yeah, like it's normal to have one day off a week, but even that one day off, you know, especially if you're leading a show, you need to live like an Olympic athlete um, and everything has to be towards that work. You can't be on a day off, like go out and hang with friends and you know, necessarily and like, you know, have a few drinks. So it's, it's kind of living like a monk for some people, you know, famously, you know, uh, um, in Dear Evan Hansen, it was uh, Ben Platt, you know, live like a monk during that time. Yeah. When, um, when Joshua Henry and Nikki Renee Daniels were in Porgy and Bess. Oh, I love his work. Oh God. Yeah. Well talk about, I was starting to think about carousel when you were talking about the trauma on yes. stage and how do you do that play? But you know, what you do is you cast someone like Joshua who no one could despise, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Anyway, back to the original point, Nikki Renee Daniels and Joshua Henry came to Kansas state to do a concert on a Monday. And it's kind of hard to get into Manhattan, Kansas, because we're two hours away from Kansas city. And if you're going to fly right into Manhattan, there's only so many flights at any rate, they came in on, they were like, well, we'll fly out Sunday after the show. It's like, you can't get a flight in on Sunday night <laughs> after your show. They ended up coming in on Monday on their day, one day off. Uh, they flew in and they came straight to our sort of noontime session with students. And one of the students asked, this is, this is several years ago, poor you best. One of the students asked, well, what do you normally do on your day off if this is your one day off? And they're like, vocal rest. We don't speak. Yeah, And they were doing a concert that evening, which I was like, I can't believe you agreed to do this on your day off. But, right. you know, they took a half an hour of questions and then they went to their hotel rooms and rested and then came back and did, you know, like an hour long concert. But it, mm-hmm. I think it was really eye opening for students that this is your one day off and they're flying back t- tomorrow to do a show that night. Mm-hmm. And what they did on their day off is a concert. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's why I think they say, you know, people will say like, you have to be, you ha- you have to not be able to do anything else. Yeah. You said an Olympic athlete. Yeah. You have to be willing to be an Olympic, an Olympic athlete for, for the stage. And there are people who, who are willing to do that and have the passion and have the drive, you know, and, and that's, that, that's incredible. But, you know, the self-care is so important. Having boundaries saying no, you know, is all part of, being able to take care of yourself so you can do the work. Absolutely. Are there themes that seem to be emerging from your work since the pandemic? What are some of the, and maybe even since before then, but I'm thinking specifically on your live series on Instagram, are there certain themes that you see emerging over and over? Yeah. Uh, some, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the identity um, a lot of the actors ha- that I've spoken to have talked about um, how the first, the, maybe the first chunk of the of the pandemic. I mean, first it was the shock, and then it was settled in, and people, you know, really struggled with well, who am I if I'm not acting? You know, if I'm not doing doing my job, mm-hmm. or audi- you know, auditioning constantly, or you know, whatever the case might be, teaching, um, and, and so you know, kind of sitting with themselves in that lack of movement and um, grappling with who am I, you know, am I my resume, you know, to quote a chorus line, um, you know, what was something that a lot of folks talked about dealing with. Gosh, I mean, another thing, another thing has been like people talking about really getting to know themselves. I mean, that's, I guess, the other side of that coin, uh, you know, because 
because there is a lot more stillness and because they are so used to that, you know, such a, a busy lifestyle and, you know, and, and the, the value of the stillness um, and the challenge of the stillness has, has been, has been a theme as well. What do you worry about for artists in this moment the most? I think, I think, I think actually just the, 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 the financial stress, and that may seem like it's a real, that has nothing to do with mental health maybe, but it does, you know, because if you, Oh, it's everything, right. If you can't pay the bills or you don't know how, how you're going to pay the bills or pay the rent, you know, kind of nothing else matters psychologically. You know, it's, it's you know, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, shelter, safety. Um, so I, I worry, I worry about that. I worry that in terms of Broadway, that New York City's not doing enough to take care of, you know, this, the, the, the industry, mm-hmm. the, the industry, which is the number one tourist attraction yes. for New York City. Um, and, and they're really not stepping up to, to take care of that industry. And not, and of course, in that case, I don't mean just the actors. I mean, everybody uh, who it takes to put on a show, the dressers, the, you know, wardrobe, um, the, the, you know, the unions, um, uh, you know, the, the front of the house staff, like everybody. I had, um, Lauren Hirsch. She was one of my first mm-hmm. interviews. Maybe she was even number three or something. Um, and she's a child guardian, uh. um, a long time child guardian on Broadway. And she was working frozen at the moment. And mm-hmm. it's, I, I can't even go back and listen to the episode cause it makes my <sighs> heart sink a little bit, but she says, on there, something like uh, everybody laughs at me because I check the numbers every day or every Monday or whenever they come out. And I was like, oh, my gosh, Lauren, you're on Frozen. It's going to run forever. It's Disney. You know, it's going to run forever. And this was like, I don't know, February or or December or something like that. And um, she was like, you never know. You just never know. And I was like, <laughs> ah, you don't have anything to worry about. It's Frozen. And then, <laughs> you know, the pandemic hit and then, you know, I was kind of staying in touch with her and, and pretty soon it, you know, it closed. I was like, Oh my gosh, Lauren. And she's like, yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking, just heartbreaking. Yeah. One of the casualties of, of, of the pandemic on Broadway for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Frozen. Um, and it is, it is heartbreaking. Right. And there's, there's, that's another role that, you know, that people don't necessarily think of, you know, that get, has been impacted by, um, the pandemic, the, you know, to be frank, the lack of uh, good leadership um, in the White House uh, about managing this uh, crisis and, and allowing our country to be prepared for it. And, um, and, and the city, you know, the city not protecting the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, I guess because I'm on the, I'm on the side of the artists who are just coming into the profession Mm -hmm. and I worry that we'll lose a generation of artists. I don't know. Maybe that's pretty dramatic to say it that way, but I do (laughs) worry that we'll lose this entire, no other way to say it, but this whole generation or this whole unit of people that might have moved to the city and started their career and, and they'll, we'll lose them. They'll go away to other careers and say, well, that was never going to happen. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a real, that's a real uh, uh, threat that, that exists. I think, especially for people who belong to groups, uh, you know, marginalized or historically um, disenfranchised because then they, you know, the people who are going to be able to afford to take that risk are the people who have the generational wealth. Yes. Um, and, and, and that doesn't make them bad because I don't mean to imply that at all, but, you know, but I think, I think that's where the real loss lies is in, is it, you know, in those groups of people. No, it's always been the case that, that if you can, if you have the funds to move to an expensive place like New York or LA and to some degree Chicago, then you can do it because you've got the safety net of, yes. you know, whether that's family wealth or even just just a little bit more, but those, like you said, disenfranchised people that maybe don't have the safety net, um, they already weren't right. coming in the same numbers as those who are supported. And now I think you're right. It'll just be a much bigger divide. It's exacerbated. Yeah. Oh, you know. okay. So <laughs> our hearts, <laughs> our hearts. <laughs> but I mean, our hearts, yes. But the one, the one thing we know is that Theater is not going away. Live theater has been around since Amen. the 
dawn of man, yep. woman, yep. people, civilization, <laughs> radio did not kill, you know, video did not kill the radio star. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, like, right. it's not going to die. It just simply won't. We'll have this, right. you know, I think there'll be a renaissance, but I hope we keep training the people to be able to invest in that renaissance. Um, so what new challenges are ahead for mental health for the artist? For the artist, yeah. Um, and, and, and thank you for saying that because, you know, I know that people, it, it, there's a real fear there that, you know, a lot of young people I see saying, well, you know, is Broadway going to be there? Like what's, you know, is it even going to be around when the, you know, when it's safe to go back? And it is important to have, you know, developmentally, you know, what's I think hard for younger people is that they don't, they don't, they're not yet there cognitively to be able to hold the long view and the short view at the same time. Ooh, talk on that more. Yeah, yeah. Talk on that more. Explain if, because a lot of my listeners are in that like beginning college or getting out of college age, talk a little bit about what's happening cognitively so they yeah. can understand this moment. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of, uh, we grow, our brains develop from the inside out and the, and the further, in, you know, inside the brain we go, the more primal it is. So it's this kind of, you know, the, the, the further out the development, the more advanced it is. And that's the last stuff to, to develop. And, and believe it or not, the, the, the reality is that we develop cognitively into the age of 25, the chronicle age of 25. People think, you know, it's it, that my guess is around 18, but it's that we actually at 18, you have seven more years of incredible cognitive growth. And so at, at the age of like 17 or 18, it is hard to you, you, the cognitive development isn't isn't quite there yet to be able to hold the 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 view of the long term and the short term at the same time, um, and and some of that is also is also exacerbated by the lack of lived experience of living through things, mm -hmm. and that does not mean that that young people are not incredibly wise and smart and have so much to offer, but there's just this you know there's this block in terms of you know kind of how far. How far the thoughts can go, and so lean on the adults, um, lean on the grown-ups who have been through stuff before, um, and who can see that long view. And so, you know, when when a professor like yourself says, "Theater's been around as long as as society has been around, as long as culture's been around, you know, for thousands of years, and we need it, so it's not going anywhere because it has to exist. It's it's essential to humanity. Um, lean on that on that faith um, because it's it's based on it's based on some real knowledge. Yeah. Good, good, good. I, yeah, I think there's a big struggle. I mean, I'm, my heart goes out to, I've had a number of students call me and say, should I take this job that has nothing to do with the arts? My answer is yes. Make some money, take the job. Yeah. It's not going yeah. anywhere. You, I had someone say to me when I was a young actor, um, I was, I was stressing about when I should move to New York city. I haven't moved there yet. And she was, we were doing a regional theater show and, Actually, Connie Shulman, I've got to get her on the show. She she's Orange is the New Black and she's the voice of she's got her start. Oh, Connie. Yeah. You know, Connie, yeah, she got her start in um uh oh gosh, what is that? Um Steel Magnolias. There we go. She got her start on Broadway in Steel That's Magnolias. Right. And That's right. people know her for the voice of Patty Mayonnaise on Doug, and she's Yoga Jones and Orange is the New Black. And anyway, she, mm -hmm. right, she was always an amazing mentor to me. And mm -hmm. I would go like Connie, I'm City. She's like, Jen, the city <laughs> is not going anywhere, even through 9-11 and everything when you thought yeah. the city was never coming back. It's not going anywhere. You could move yeah. there later. It will still be here. Yeah, it's so it's so true. <laughs> Good advice. Yeah. OK, so what um, what new challenges do you see ahead for you? W will you expand Dr. Drama in some way? Um do you have anything on the horizon you want to share? Yeah, um, you know, I I would I would I guess I would re I would reframe that as not so much a challenge um, because this uh, all that I'm doing with Doctor Drama is is you know to kind of put it simply like giving it away. So although there have been challenges in terms of like learning new technologies um, and you know that kind of stuff, yes, the the work of what I'm doing, so to speak, is is not a challenge because it's an offering. It's it's um, it's my attempt to to provide uh, something an act of service. Um, but but you know in terms of where that goes, um, I'm so open to it going 
where it's meant to be. Uh, again, because it's 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 not defined, it's not prescribed. Um, it just is what it is. And so for now, I'm continuing the the mental health series on um, you know on Instagram. I have a lot you know weeks and weeks and weeks more of guests lined up, and that will continue after. You know, uh, we could we just continue on. Had one yesterday in in the midst of you know all the election craziness, um, and you know it's always very, uh, very meaningful, and it always kind of energizes me to to have those conversations. Um, maybe that will kind of permanently turn into a podcast. Is is what I've been thinking about. Kind of after after when we're on the other side of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And kind of, you know, going back to our lives a little bit. Um, some of that's just kind of functional for me. I'm able to do those because I'm working from home. And so, you know, once I'm going back to the office, it's just kind of a logistical thing. Um, but uh, th- that that may be where it's going next, but maybe not. <laughs> I'll see and I'll see where it goes, but I'm not going anywhere because, uh, you know, whatever form it takes, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, I want to continue doing this. And there's been just such a beautiful, wonderful response to it. Yeah, that's great. And I feel we're doing sort of cognate things. It's the same for me. I mean, I don't, I've heard podcasts talk about Patreon and making money. And it's like, I, I just mm. want to share that. I just want to get this out there. It's a need. Yes. I want students to be able to hear these stories. It's my offering. I love that you say that. This is my offering to the world. Yeah. I mean, I've done some some one-off, you know, workshops, um, education, um, and you know, that have you know, been compensated for and, and that dynamic is different. So that, that I'm okay, you know, I'm also okay with, with that being, being paid because that's not necessarily part of, part of my offering. And so to share that expertise in that way, you know, and get paid for it is, it does feel, uh, does feel appropriate. And I've done some consulting on shows, um, which, which I've done gratis, um, be, just because I just love doing it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, for example, on local production, a couple of, a uh, couple of, uh, of theater productions of next to normal. Um, and then a new show, um, in New York. Uh, but you know, if that ever gets, you know, it's part of, you know, being, being compensated for, I'm also, I'm okay with that. And I'm, I'm also okay with not again, because I just, I love doing it, but, um, because I'm in a position to be able to offer, you know, offer these discussions about mental health, you know, without compensation, like you were saying, like, I'm, I'm in a position to do that. So I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing it because I want to give it away, you know, and I love, there's a saying that, that, uh, you know, you have to give it away to keep it Yeah. that I, that I really love and kind of think about sometimes. Also, you're looking at your population or your audience, your target audience being possibly people, especially in this moment who aren't able to pay for your services. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that you're doing. I try to be really cognizant about having a variety of voices on because I do specialize in working with the trans community um, in my, in my clinical practice. Um, I, uh, I have a special, you know, affinity for having on guests who are gender non-conforming, um, non-binary, um, transgender. And, you know, I think about the young people and we hear it on the, in the threads when we have those episodes, you know, young people in the middle of the country, you know, who don't have support or aren't out, you know, and, and are part of that, but are part of that community and, and seeing somebody like Ezra Munis, um, who is in Jag Little Pill and going and in the uh, West Side Story film as anybody's talking about, about their experience, um, and, you know, and kind of giving, experience strength and hope to, to this, you know, the young people in the middle of the country who don't have that at home. I mean, that, that is awesome. That, that, that really matters. Um, And and I'm glad to have a platform to be able to, to provide that. Yeah. I mean, here I am in Kansas and we have some trans students across the university, but in our program as well. And, you know, you feel a responsibility to make sure you're that support because maybe they don't get it somewhere else. Mm Hmm. Yes. Do you see the artists that you're interviewing talking about a backup plan right now? Um, huh. I don't see them talking uh, about, well, yes, but it's still in the arts. It's teaching. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's voice lesson, you know, providing voice lessons. Uh, it's pivoting, you know, coaching. Yeah. Creating podcasts. Je- um, Jennifer Samard and Jessica Voss just came out with this really great podcast called Killing It on Broadway that's actually about uh, about um, true crime, um, uh, but with their, you know, kind of particular entertainment spin on it, um, and they have different guests on from Broadway, 
um, talking about a particular, you know, case from their home state, you know, and, and, um, you know, so they've pivoted, um, and, and, and Jennifer, um, talks on, on that podcast too, about, uh, also studying forensic psychology, um, <laughs> during this time as well, yeah. getting a degree in forensic psychology. So, yeah, I mean, some, I think, I think some of the people, uh, uh, talk about pivoting, you see, um, uh, Max Clayton, um, who's in right now in Moulin Rouge, um, he shared on, on social media that he became a real estate agent in the city for this time. So, um, you, yeah, do, I do see that. And I also see some people just kind of sitting tight and trying to wait it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have an idea of, I mean, you said you, from the beginning, you wanted to be a psychologist. Did you ever question mm -hmm. that or you knew there was a pretty straightforward path to doing it? Uh, I think for like, a day and a half, I was pre-med in college. <laughs> that was about <laughs> as far as I strayed from it. Um, I also went to a very uh, strong pre-med uh, school. And, um, and you know, I just remember being in chemistry class, you know, requirement for pre-med, but also requirement for, for the psychology major. And um, and it was graded on a curve. And I, I, I that's what took a day and a half for me to change my mind back to psychology because I was like, and this is not my strength. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and it's such, it is such a clear path. Like it's so prescribed how you do that, how you become that or, you know, enter that career. Mm -hmm. um, so that always felt like the right choice for me, uh, minus that day and a half. And, and, and it's such a clear path, unlike, unlike acting, which is such a diffuse path. Um, you know, so there, there is a uh, security in that for sure. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't stray. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, every kind of step along the way has just confirmed, you know, that decision. It's, it's, it's definitely my calling. But, but you created, well, and I love that. And you're obviously so great at it. And, but you did say, you know, you created Dr. Drama because that was something you wanted to do and you felt that there was a need out mm. there. So that was something that didn't exist before mm -hmm. that you created. So did you have to see somebody or model yourself after anyone mm. to be able to know that you could do that? Or was that just in you? I love that question. Um, uh, the inspiration, I suppose, was in me, but um, I, I did benefit from the um, the advice uh, uh, of two people who just kind of gave me the the words of encouragement that that solidified that that direction. Um, and to call them out for a second, it's Laura Haywood, um, who people know as Broadway Girl, um, and uh, Jillian Pensavale, who does the wildly popular true crime pro. Um, True Crime Obsessed podcast, and then also, but also the, uh, the Hamilcast, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the unofficial podcast of uh, of Hamilton. But everybody on, on the show's been on it, including Lin Manuel Miranda himself. Reached out to both of them, um, and and they both said the same thing in essence, which was, "Oh my gosh, you have the passion for this, make the thing." Mm -hmm. um, and and so the, I I that's and that's what I it also goes back to that idea of like you have to give it away to keep it, so that that was their experience you know in 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 following their passion and and just making the thing they had the passion to do it so they did it and so they passed on that that experience that um that lesson and i try to do that too when people will whatever you know reach out to me and ask that question it's passed that on i give it away you know if if you have the passion and the wherewithal to 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 do it um the the you know the motivation um and you you you're bringing your voice to it make the thing. Um, and I always appreciate those two women for, you know, just so generously giving, giving away that, that knowledge. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll have to get, see if I can get them on. Cause I, you know, it's cognitive oh, things. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's here, you know, for me, it was, Students always love when we get guest artists on in on campus and the thing that, you know, they may do a workshop and, you know, acting and often they say the same things that the professors say. But, you know, now they're hearing it from someone who's out there, even beyond the skills that they learn in a workshop. They are obsessed with the journey story mm -hmm. of what was your path? And it's what you said. It's a diffuse path. It's diffused. So mm -hmm. what was your path? How can I learn more about how I can follow in your footsteps? And I thought, gosh, I can do that mm -hmm. every week for them. They don't, we don't have to spend money to bring someone in. We can just do that every week. So it's been right. a similar, like, let's just give it away. I'm passionate about it. And um, 
I love to hear other people that are doing it too. Yeah. Yeah. It is inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any advice that you could give in this moment about self-care and mental health and just kind of staying on track? Yeah. um, Two things come to mind. Um, One is self-care. I always say that in my job as a psychologist, that that self-care is the most important part of my job. Actually, in my my role as a mom, self-care is the most important part of my job. Mm -hmm. Um, You won't have you won't have it to give away if you, if you aren't refueled. So know, you know, discover what those things are. Know what those things are that refuel you. Know if you get refueled by spending time by yourself or by spending time with other people. Know if that, you know, being in nature refuels you. Know if, you know, stillness and quiet <clears throat> refuel you or, you know, uh, uh, you know, exercise refuels you. Know these things about yourself. And I also think about um, just how you know, kind of beyond the logistical advice, like how, how you are as a human in this world really, really matters. And, and I think especially for female identifying folks that, that we get this message that, that kindness and assertiveness are mutually exclusive and they're not. And I, and I think to be successful, which doesn't mean rich or at the highest supposed echelon of your career, but for me, successful means existing as a, as a human in the world who creates positive change in whatever way that is for you, um, that you can be a kind person and truly treat people the way you want to be treated and have good boundaries um, and be able to say no to things or that's not okay with me. You, those two things can coexist and that will help you have success as a human in your life, which translates to success across the board. Oh, how that makes sense. Yes, that makes total sense. No, I mean, I'm completely projecting it onto myself and my own. You you (laughs) asked some questions. I was like, hmm, how does that work for me? Um, Mm. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing this. I will be uh, tuning in, I guess. Can you say that about the internet? I've been logging on to (laughs) the Mental Health Live series on Instagram and continuing to follow you. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Drama. Mm, Thank you so much for having me. I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Awesome. I'm Jen Valenga, and this is the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. I'm taking a holiday break as I prepare to go on sabbatical for my university teaching job and turn my attention completely to Ditch Your Backup Plan and related endeavors. If you want to hear more about what this pivot looks like for the next eight months, join me on Facebook Live on December 15th, 5 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Central, and 2 o'clock Pacific Time. I'll be on Facebook Live in the Ditch Your Backup Plan community group. This was a short season two. I'll be back with season three in January. And I'll share a collage episode from seasons one and two right before the start of the new year. Happy, happy holidays. Heads up, fearless friends. Thanks for listening.